Hey guys, uh, if you've listened to this podcast for any time at all, you know how much I care about keeping pet care accessible to pet owners and um, and how much I hate when people don't have the resources they need to take care of their pets or staff included. Guys, if you are here, you're probably pretty hardcore about pet health care. Figo Pet Insurance helps you and your clients prepare for the unexpected so that you never have to make the tough choice between your pet's health and your wallet. <laughs> Whether uh, these pets are, are eating out of the trash or diving off of furniture, pets don't always make the best decisions. We know that, but with FIGO, you can and pet owners can. Designed for pets and their people, FIGO allows you to worry less and play more with customizable coverage for accidents, illness, and routine wellness. <laughs> to get a quick and easy quote, visit FIGOPET.com slash cone of shame. That's F I G O P E T dot com slash cone of shame figo's policies are underwritten by independence american insurance company welcome everybody to the cone of shame veterinary podcast i am your host dr andy Rourke. guys i am here with my friend dr Dottie laflam today she is a boarded vet nutritionist uh she is she's uh retired she's only doing research and things now uh she's not affiliated with with any company as she mentions at the end uh she had done some work on purina center square which is a uh, public um educational resource that everybody can check out it's really good um but yeah she's she's fantastic and she's just talking about carbohydrates and cats based on an article that she published earlier this year guys let's get into it this is your show we're glad you're here we want to help you in your veterinary career welcome to the cone of shame with Dr. Andy Rourke. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Dottie Laflamme. Thank you for being here. Thank you. My pleasure. Oh, it is. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, this is this is the second time we've gotten to chat, and uh, and I love the first time. And so, anyway, I'm glad to have you on the podcast. Uh, you are a boarded veterinary nutritionist, and you had an article earlier this year in the Journal of the AVMA called "Evidence Does Not Support the Controversy Regarding Carbohydrates in Feline Diets." And I just wanted to get on and unpack that a little bit with you because obviously we get a lot of questions in the exam room and there's a lot of questions about cats and carbs and there's a lot of internet uh, discussion of that topic. So I just wanted to, to pick your brain a little bit and, and get into that. Can you start by just sort of laying down what is, what is the controversy uh, with cats and carbohydrates? That's great. And it's probably a multifold controversy, but I think the essence of it is that um, some veterinarians, uh, and a lot of cat owners perceive that carbohydrates are either inappropriate for cats or downright detrimental. And by our title, what we're really saying is that's not really true. And nothing is quite as clear cut as, you know, A equals B, or this is not good under any circumstances. The truth is um, there could be a few select circumstances where carbohydrates may not be appropriate for cats. But for the most part, and hopefully we can talk about lots of the, the details of that, um, for the most part, there's absolutely nothing wrong with cats eating carbohydrates if they're properly processed and part of a nutritionally balanced diet. Okay. Well, talk, talk to me a little bit about kind of the role that carbohydrates play in feline nutrition. Okay. Well, if we think about foodstuffs, whether we're talking about cats or whether we're talking about ourselves or any other creatures, okay, there are three what are called macronutrients because they're in there in large quantities. There's three macronutrients that provide 100% of the energy that our body uses. Those macronutrients are proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. Our bodies, and that includes the cats, can derive energy from any of those three. Uh, in fact, um, they get more energy from fat on a gram per gram basis, on a weight basis. They get more than twice as much calories from fat as they do from carbohydrates or proteins. So, um, so we need to keep that in mind when we're formulating diets or looking at what we're feeding because how many calories do our cats need? There's a lot of fat cats out there. 
that said, the benefit of carbohydrates in the diet is it is a source of calories that the cat can use. Now, there's other uh, benefits to it as well. For example, if a cat is being fed a low carbohydrate diet, they will actually take protein and break down the proteins in order to make glucose, which is a carbohydrate, it is a sugar, which can come from the carbohydrate, but it can come from protein. So if you're not giving them enough carbohydrate in the diet, they're going to break down protein that could otherwise be going to support lean body mass and, and protein synthesis and use that for energy. Okay. Tell me, tell me a little bit about cat carbohydrates in the wild. Cause I think that's where a lot of this comes from, right? Is, is cats obligate, obligate predator. It's, it's, it's a, or obligate carnivore. You say, um, what, what carbohydrates are they eating out in the wild? And I think a lot of people want to replicate the traditional, you know, um, evolutionary diet of cats. And so I think that's a question that I, that I kind of have is to say, well, what is, what is normal for cat uh, sort of cats in the wild? Uh, how, how, do, how do they, how do they survive in a, in a landscape that doesn't have kibble? Let's start by defining what we mean by a carbohydrate. Um, the most common perception of that is meat eater. But that's not quite correct. A, car, a, a carnivore is an animal eater, a prey eater. So they are going to eat basically all of that prey. And so that includes the stomach contents, the intestinal contents, as well as all the musculature, all the bone, uh, all the organs, all the byproducts. Um, so all of that is consumed by the predator, whether that's a cat or a dog or a wolf or bear or whatnot. Um, so they're getting more than just meat when they do that so given that one of the one of the um, let's look at the statistical perspective first and then the practical two different studies um, have looked at a cat in the wild eating prey and other foods that it can get to how much carbohydrate are they actually eating one study showed it was really low it was about two and a half percent of the calories. A different study showed it was actually a little bit higher. It was about 15%. Um, and let's put that in perspective of nursing kittens and how much carbohydrate does a cat put into its milk and it's about 15 to 25%. So there's a fair bit of a fair bit of carbohydrate that's naturally present in the diet. So it's not that cats don't want carbohydrates, but it's often said, well, you won't see dogs or cats in the wild going out and grazing on a wheat plant. Well, that's true. Um, but, but cats and wild animals in general are opportunistic in what they eat. So they eat what they can get. And if what they get is enough to keep them alive and allow them to reproduce, then the species will survive. So the feral cat diet, if there is no but he feeding them, there's no kibble being fed, um, generally has somewhere between five and 15% carbohydrate in it. And those wild cats survive. But what's the average lifespan of feral cats? It's something like two or three years. It's, it's relatively short compared to the 15, 20 plus years that we want our pet cats to live. So they could survive on that. But is it optimum nutrition? I, I I think there's no evidence to support that conjecture, right? And that, and that fits with the uh, with the with the conversation we have about dogs and wolves. And people say, "Well, I want my dog to eat what a wolf eats," and you know, the average wolf dies at age four. So um, you know, it's a uh, yeah, it, it's it's a it's a standard. I, I I personally understand where people come from. They look at at cats and how they're sort of made and designed, and say, "Well, I want to feed something that that fits with uh, what they are and who they are." Th that that all makes sense to me. Uh, when we talk about, I don't feel like we get nearly as much pushback on this uh, from dog owners or about dogs as we do a, about cats. How unique are cats and how they use carbohydrates? I mean, are they, is, is cat digestion of, of carbohydrates fairly similar to dogs or uh, humans? Or, or are they pretty unique in how they break down and use carbohydrates? Well, the, the, the correct, the short answer is both. Assuming we're talking about properly processed carbohydrates, because I have to say, if we're talking about any kind of carbohydrate starch, think about the sources of carbohydrates like rice and, and wheat and, and other grains and potatoes and things like that. We wouldn't eat a bowl of raw rice or a raw potato because that's not digestible. 
but we cook it. You know, we bake our potatoes, we boil our rice, whatever it might be. So if we're talking about properly cooked carbohydrates, cats can digest them essentially as well as dogs. There's one study that, that the, they made a bunch of different diets, different grains, and they fed them to cats. And then they made very, very similar diets and fed them to dogs. And the carbohydrate digestibility for all the different diets, dogs and cats, was well over 90%. So cats really don't have any trouble digesting carbohydrates. That said, there are some unique features about cat metabolism. They don't have the enzyme amylase, salivary amylase that we have. So we actually start breaking down carbohydrates while it's still in the mouth. Cats don't have that, but neither do dogs. So it's not absolutely unique to cats. It's just, there are some species differences. There are other digestive enzymes, pancreatic amylase, different en enzymes that are produced within the digestive tract that cats have less of compared to dogs. Um, but then there's other enzymes that they actually have more of. Um, they also lack um, the taste receptor for sweet. And, and there's a number of other things, the way they actually metabolize um, glucose from the bloodstream. There's an enzyme that's requiring, required for, for bringing that, that um, shall we say, trapping that glucose into the cell. It's a glucokinase. And um, cats don't have specifically glucokinase. But they have hexokinase in abundant quantities, and the hexokinase works in the same way that the glucokinase does. It just works a little slower. So cats are very similar, and yet they're different. And because of these differences, they do tend to process blood glucose a little bit slower than dogs do, for example. Um, but that's also consistent with the way cats normally and naturally eat. They eat a lot of small little meals, up to 20 meals a day. So they're getting a small amount at a time compared to the way dogs in the wild would, which is to eat large quantities all at once. So it's consistent with their, with their metabolism. Bottom line, there are some differences, but a lot of similarities. That, no, that, that's, good. that's good to know. Are there uh, advantages and disadvantages to a low carb diet for cats? Assuming we're talking healthy cats, not diabetic cats, but healthy cats, the advantage to a low carb diet is, um, there, let me put it this way. There's absolutely no evidence of a benefit to a low carb diet for a healthy cat. The potential disadvantage is, as I was mentioning earlier, if you, uh, okay, uh, cats need calories, just like we all do, and they come from protein or carbohydrates or fats. By definition, when you remove one of those macronutrients, the sum of the total, you have to see the other two increase. So a low carbohydrate diet generally is higher in fat and higher in protein and higher in calories because fat has more calories than carbohydrates. Okay. So the disadvantage of a low carbohydrate diet is the resulting diets tend to be higher in calories. And because obesity is a major issue in cats, there's actually a greater risk for obesity in cats fed high fat diets. So there's no specific advantage. And the only real disadvantage is that calorie thing. So if you're feeding a low carbohydrate diet because you want to, there's no harm to the cat as long as they're being fed the right amount of calories. But there's no, just, there's no advantage either. Hey everybody, I'm just jumping in with two lightning fast updates. Number one, if you have not gotten signed up for the Get Sh done shorthanded virtual conference in October. It's October 6th through the 8th. You need to do that. If you are feeling overwhelmed in your practice, if you want things to go smoother and faster, if you do not want to watch webinars, you want to actually talk about your practice. You want to do some discussion groups. You want to do some workshops where you actually make things and work on things and ask questions as we go along and have roundtable discussions and things like that. That's really going to energize you and help you figure out actionable solutions that you can immediately put into practice to make your life simpler and more 
more relaxed. I got you covered, buddy, but you don't want to miss it. Go ahead and get registered. Mark yourself off at the clinic for the time so that you can be here and be present and really take advantage of this. I don't want to sneak up on you. I know October seems like a long way away. It's not, but go ahead. I'm going to put a link down below and then when registration opens, we'll let you know it's open and you can grab your spot, but you do not want to sneak up on you. Check out our Get Sh Done Shorthanded Conference. It's going to be a great one. The second thing I'm going to tell you about is uh, Banfield. Thank you to Banfield the Hospital for making transcripts of this podcast available. You can find them at drandywork.com. They are totally free and open to the public and Banfield supports this to increase accessibility and inclusion in our profession. It's a wonderful thing that they do. Guys, that's all I got. Let's get back into this episode. take this a little bit into a medical context and start to say, can you talk to me a little bit about um, about about clinical practice and, and carbohydrates? I mean, I, I immediately think of cats with diabetes, things like that. Are there are there medical instances, uh, cases that we commonly see where we want to pay attention to carbohydrate intake specifically, where they can be detrimental or beneficial? Sure. Uh, and, and here's where we're kind of, okay, let's talk specifically about diabetes first, and then maybe a couple of other circumstances. So in the face of diabetes, um, cats are already unable to process um, glucose properly. And so it accumulates in the bloodstream, they're glucose intolerant and, and, and insulin resistant. So they have a hard time clearing the glucose out of the bloodstream. And so feeding large amounts of, of glucose or carbohydrate to a cat that's diabetic is going to cause um, a, a undesirable increase in glucose in the bloodstream. So two of the ways to get around that, of course, is to feed less carbohydrate. So there's less being released into the bloodstream. And the other is to feed it in um, s s frequent small meals so that the total amount of carbohydrate going into the bloodstream, even in diabetic cats, is not as much the issue, it's the inability to clear it out. And so it's because of the difference between the different glucose transporters, the insulin dependent and, and non-insulin dependent. So the non-insulin dependent, such as GLUT1, um, will still be able to process enough glucose to keep the cat's cells fed, but the, the insulin dependent, the GLUT4, is the one that's, that's not working properly, so they can't process as much. Um, so I, I think the bottom line is I, the consensus opinion is that limiting carbohydrate intake in the face of diabetes is a positive thing. The other conditions where carbohydrates or carbohydrate sources, in other words, grains, um, are raised up as possible issues uh, is in the face of GI disease. And, um, and, and food sensitivities, so food allergies and food sensitivities, whether that's uh, you know, skin related issues or GI related issues. That seems to be more of a, either a misperception or a rarity as opposed to a commonality. Um, the reason I say that is if you look at the, uh, the published statistics, feline allergies to grains are extremely less common um, compared to feline allergies to various animal proteins. That makes sense. I mean, that, that tracks again, kind of with what we see with, with dogs as well as sort of the push to the, uh, to the grain-free foods and things like that. And, and a lot of people come with the idea that they're hypoallergenic or they're, they're good for sort of food allergies and things. And, you know, veterinarians have wrestled with that for a long time. Help me understand uh, the differences in is help me understand what we can expect with carbohydrates in, in your average sort of commercial cat food, for example. So we talked about, you know, feral cats being at five to 15 percent carbohydrate in their diets. What what do we see? Is there is there a sort of a recognized standard in modern pet food or, or high quality pet food? Um, yeah. And, and how much variance is there? Okay. Really, really good question. Um, there's, there's big differences on average between dry foods and wet foods like canned foods and pouched foods that in general, the wet foods are lower in carbohydrates compared to the dry foods. And part of that is based on the ingredients used. Part of it is the fact that normal cooking and processing of dry foods actually requires a certain amount of carbohydrate in the diet in order to form the kibble. 
you know, it'd be like trying to make bread without gluten or without flour, you know, really need to have that in there. Um, so if we look at what's average in the U.S. at least, um, the average uh, amount of carbohydrate in wet foods is, is well under 10%. Whereas in dry foods, it's somewhere in, I don't know, about 35% plus and minus on average. This, the, the review that we did, the paper you had referenced, um, one of the things we looked at was all of the published literature where they were looking for adverse effects for carbohydrates. And at what level do you start to see adverse effects? And um, the studies basically found no adverse effects with the possible exception of diets that were about 50% of carbohydrates coming from, um, from the, from the diet, 50% of the calories coming from carbohydrates. And it, at that level, first of all, at that level, the protein in the diet is really low. So the first challenge you would have is that the diet would no longer be nutritionally balanced. It would have not enough protein in the diet. Um, in that study that used that kind of diet, they did see unusually high um, serum glucose levels. And in some cats, they also saw GI upset, diarrhea, and so forth. So that's the kind of risk you might be looking for. But the biggest risk, if you're talking about that much carbohydrate in the diet, the biggest risk is there's not going to be enough room to have enough protein in the diet. Given the difference that we see in carbohydrate levels between dry and wet foods, just in their compositions, we just sort of talked about, um, do you have a preference of, of wet versus dry food when feeding cats? Are you one of those wet food cat people or do you, are you a mixture person or how, did, how did, does that affect your thinking? And if so, how? That's a really great question. And, and I, I really need to unpack it because the, the first part of that is, is carbohydrates. And the other part of that is water, wet versus dry. So from a carbohydrate point of view, here's, here's really the way to look at it. Cats need nutrients, not ingredients. Okay. And they don't, require a dietary source of carbohydrates. And the reason they don't is that carbohydrates are so important to the cat that the body has its own mechanism for creating carbohydrates. In other words, for creating glucose. Okay. So the body absolutely has a requirement for carbohydrate. Either they're going to make their own or they're going to get it from the diet. And so if we're looking at carbohydrate in the diet, then the body can use that and it doesn't have to create its own, which means it can spare protein. And I think that's, that's a significant benefit to the higher carbohydrate diets within a nutritionally balanced diet. Okay. So from a, from a, from a nutritional perspective, I think there's no real advantage of a dry food versus a wet food or a wet food versus a dry food, as long as it is nutritionally complete and balanced. Not all foods are. So that's just an important thing to keep in mind. But assuming that they are from a nutritional perspective, there's really not an advantage one over the other. Now let's talk about wet food. Um, there are pros and cons to wet food. Some of the pro is that you've got a lot of water there. And that is some cats need that extra water either because they don't naturally drink enough or because they happen to have a health condition like, you know, urolithiasis or kidney disease or something where they need that extra water. I'm going to say forced on them. They need that extra water. So that's where wet foods are really beneficial. The other advantage of wet foods, because they come in small cans, especially if you give them little tiny cans, there's relatively few calories because it's mostly water. And so uh, feeding wet foods might make it easier for cat owners to control the calorie intake and would help them potentially in managing their cat's weight. And I'm saying that potentially because it's not an absolute for sure. That's really the advantage of cat of wet only in my perspective. One of the advantages of dry, since we're doing a comparison, one of the advantages of dry is it does provide a better oral care benefit. It helps to keep the teeth cleaned longer. 
Um, not that it's a replacement for dental care, but it does reduce plaque and tartar and, and oral disease compared to wet food. So if you're comparing 100% dry versus 100% wet, those are kind of the, the benefits. The advantage of the mix is that you get the dental benefit of the dry, um, and then feeding your variety of wet foods gives you a chance to feed a variety without totally changing the diet up. That said, if you're really trying to feed wet food for the purpose of forcing the cat to consume more water, you almost have to go to a completely, completely 100% wet food diet. Because if it's 50%, 50, the cat fully compensates and, and drinks water or doesn't drink water as it needs. So one of the things we have to think about whether we're talking about wet food, dry food, carbohydrates, protein, whatever, cats are very adaptable. And, and no matter what you're trying to do to them, they'll they'll adapt based on their own physiology. Yeah, on the, on their on their own willful desires. Often is what it seems. But. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Doctor Lafland, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you coming in and making time to talk with me. My pleasure. And if you ever have any more questions, let me know. Oh, I will let you know for sure. Do you have I have one one last question? Do you have favorite resources for people that are interested in feline nutrition? What's a, what's at the top of your list? There's a couple of good uh, websites. One of them, I have to admit, I, I helped with the formulation of that as a consultant for the Purina company, and that's Purina Institute Center Square. It's a great resource for veterinarians as well as um, for them to share with their clientele. Tufts University has a great website also um, with good nutrition information. I don't have that, uh, address for you right now, but I'll, I'll pull it and I'll put it in the show notes for people who want to find it. Right, those are a couple of great ones right there, as well as the AAVN.org website, the American Academy of Veterinary Nutrition. That's outstanding. Great. I'll put all those links in the show notes. Thank you again for being here, guys. Uh, everybody take care of yourselves. Have a wonderful week. And that is our episode. That's what we got for you. As I said, have a wonderful week, everybody. If you uh, if you love this episode, leave me a review uh, wherever you get your podcast. Anywhere that it says rate this podcast, you just rate this podcast. Uh, and if you don't like the episode, then just maybe wait until next week and see what you think before you write a review. I don't know that, you know, just just, just think about it for a while before you do that. <laughs> anyway, guys, take it easy. I'll see you later on.